and munitions from America had been sent, and miles of bandages cut and rolled for shipment to the front. When our own boys went over, the jobs left behind in railway yards and factories, on farms and in the cities, were filled by the wives and daughters, sisters and sweethearts of our soldiers now fighting in France. The women of America went to war, too, and built planes and guns. They filled the shells with powder and stretched linen over the wings of the planes which would carry the Allied forces in the fight for liberty. Of the many women who supported our efforts in the war, few would be remembered as often and with such affection as the Red Cross nurses. They helped in the overwhelming task of healing the wounded. The volunteers in the Red Cross, the YMCA, and the Army Medical Corps helped to keep the soldiers' spirits high. And the Red Cross drives at home encouraged us all to help as well. Perhaps it is surprising that something as simple as a candy bar or a package of cigarettes could mean so much to the fighting men so far from home. But in fact, these tokens meant so much because they were from home. Now, our boys, too, were on the battlefields of France. As they arrived, they still had a sense of the honor and of the glory in saving a people from terror. Our boys were brave, and they approached the front with jubilation. But this feeling could not last, for with the constant roar of the battle came the realization of what this war was really like. Flags were of less comfort than a letter from home, and strident marches fell on unenthusiastic ears. Now it was real. Our boys slogged through the mud and fought side by side with the British and the French. The young Americans must have proved a contrast to the battle-weary Europeans, and their idealism must have seemed peculiar to those who had seen the Battle of the Marne and the carnage at the Somme and at Verdun. The weeks dragged into months, and the prediction that our boys would be home by Christmas proved naive. Christmas came and passed and another year began in the trenches. It seemed as if there would never be an end to Armageddon. Where a generation of men of all nations would die. Where the battlefields were littered with soldiers whose bodies no longer knew night or day, rain, and here, when night fell on the living, rats crawled among the trenches. Here, at Armageddon.
Before his death in the Great War, one soldier, Wilfred Owen, wrote these lines. Move him. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once at home, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, woke him even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds. Woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Why did we fight? For glory? Or for gain? For wealth? Or profit? And at what cost? We fought in the name of freedom, but the sight of waving flags and the sound of solemn hymns and rousing marches were far away, and they seemed so long ago. Ten million men were dead. Home, our concerns 